Please welcome to the stage, John Scully. Welcome thank to you, TED. John. Thanks. Thank you. It's all my clicker. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether many of you know, but I actually grew up in Bermuda and uh, spent many years here. So it's a uh, real. <laughs> so it's a real thrill to be back here. Uh, what would you think if I told you that we are on the threshold of an emerging information technology that has the potential to change almost everything that medical professions, professionals know about medicine and has the potential to be a key piece to the puzzle of how do we deal with a $2.7 trillion dollar healthcare spend in the United States, and of course, you know, large expenditures all around the world in healthcare. How do we deal with something that in the United States is running at an inflation rate of 9% a year, projected to be 25% of the GDP by the year 2020? Obviously unaffordable. What I'm going to talk to you about is something that uh, is just beginning to move into being productized. Uh, all the elements are there, and my goal during this talk is to take the rather dry subject of high technology, try to demystify it for you a bit, and to connect the dots, and to hopefully get you uh, thinking about, gee, there may be some opportunities to really have some fundamental breakthroughs in the world of healthcare. So, uh, if I... Uh, go back uh, to the uh, time when I joined the high-tech industry. Uh, Steve Jobs recruited me 30 years ago. Uh, that was uh, a little less than two years before the Macintosh was introduced in 1984. And I had the chance to work with uh, some really incredibly talented people. Steve Jobs, obviously, uh, one of the world's greatest visionaries. Bill Gates, who was developing software for the Mac. And both of these geniuses uh, had a vision that they were absolutely convinced where the world was going to go and it was going to be changed by personal computers. And they turned out to be correct. And what we saw during the decade of the 1980s was the empowerment of the individual, as Steve Jobs used to say, uh, creating a bicycle for the mind. As Bill Gates would say, uh, we're going to do it by changing the world one person at a time. And we ended up with the knowledge worker being empowered with this new tool, personal computers, and it led to smarter workers, and smarter workers led to one of the greatest uh, lifts in productivity that the world had ever seen. And then in the 1990s, in fact, 1994, the internet, which had been around for really several decades, but not as a commercial network, but uh, one that was being developed for scientists and for uh, government labs, the internet became commercial with the World Wide Web. And during the mid-1990s until the present, we've seen the internet era, and the internet era was quite different from the personal computer era, because the internet era meant that people were connected, they could collaborate, they were able to uh, defy distance. We saw the virtual organization, and in fact, one of the reasons why I think Bermuda is as successful as it is, uh, is that it has highly skilled people able to work here with other highly skilled people all over the world, and distance is no longer relevant. So, another big lift in world productivity with the era of the global economy. Well, now we're into a new era, and Steve Jobs said uh, shortly before he died, he said this is the post-PC era. And the post-PC era is being defined by four big brand companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. And each of these companies have built massive data centers, which we call the cloud. And these data centers are collecting incredible amounts of information. In fact, they never throw any information away. And they are collecting information about people's behavior, about what they like, what they don't like, what they buy, what they don't buy. And it's building the most comprehensive database that the world has ever seen at a scale that no one could have possibly imagined even a decade ago. 
And what that has led to in this new era is another uh, fundamental change in information technology in terms of what it can do, and it's leading to smarter customers. And smarter customers, if you're shopping on Amazon or you're uh, buying products on iTunes or App Store, uh, smarter customers means that uh, those companies know more about you and they can help you be smarter in terms of price, in terms of quality, in terms of what you're looking for. Uh, and smarter uh, customers is leading to a complete reconceptualization of industries from music to publishing to uh, e-commerce. And it's in this last era of smarter customers that we start to see the building blocks for what I think has the potential to be a game changer in medicine. Now, one of the th questions uh, people ask me a lot is they say, well, I've heard about the cloud, but what is this thing called the cloud? And where did it all come from? And why do they call it a cloud? Well, it turns out that uh, the terminology cloud was developed by uh, the top scientist in Bell Labs in New Jersey uh, over 30 years ago when they were developing all the circuit switches that enable telephones to be connected to each other and to other telephone systems back in the analog world. This is the pre-digital world. And those uh, people who came up with the term cloud are affectionately known in the technology world as the bellheads. <laughs> and then on the other side of the country, out in Silicon Valley, uh, as the world started to go digital, after the uh, personal computer came out, after the uh, internet developed, and everything was starting to go digital. Uh, then we had the, the Silicon Valley uh, high-tech engineers, and they said, well, we like that name, the cloud, uh, but we're digital guys, we're netheads. And so the netheads adopted the name that the bellheads had used, and that's what we call the cloud. And the cloud is all of the computers and in data centers, it's all of the storage, all of the networking equipment, all of the software that makes this stuff work. And if you look at the internet era, which only began 20 years ago, and you look at what were the sort of standout characteristics of it, but one was that the top talent in terms of uh, where they stood in the pecking order of people saying, yeah, they are, they are the ones, were the computer scientists. Now, these were the really smart guys uh, who were writing the code, particularly to give you a user experience that could work on an end-to-end -end system. So uh, when you think of Apple, it's always been an end-to-end -end system. That's the way Steve Jobs designed it back with desktop publishing, back in the PC era. But in the internet era, uh, we started to see things like uh, iTunes, which was an end-to-end -end system, which meant that you could uh, use a device, be able to... Uh, buy a music um, song on that device, but it was all coming out over a service that was uh, being hosted on the cloud. App Stores is another end-to-end -end system, and the user experience is what those cons computer scientists uh, really were trying to excel. They were craftspeople uh, who wanted to be known as the artists who could create the very best user experience. And they worked with what's known as structured data. Structured data is what we've had around for decades, big companies like IBM and Oracle build these relational databases, and it's all based on structured data, which means usually you're looking at the correlation between um, a couple of different factors. It might be, uh, what is the buying pattern of women age 18 to 34 who uh, like to go to spas, and what kind of um, you know, clothing products do they prefer? Those are structured type of questions using structured data. But now we're in this new era. Remember I said we're moving into the cloud era, quite different than the internet era that we saw back in the, in the last couple of decades. And in the cloud era, what's defining is mobility. Everything is going wireless. Everything is getting smaller, miniaturized. And of course, uh, I bet there isn't anyone here who doesn't have either a cell phone or a smartphone, an iPhone, an Android phone, a, a RIM BlackBerry phone. Uh, it's become indispensable in most of our lives. And these devices are all being connected back up into the cloud, and there's incredible amounts of information that's being 
manage in the cloud. And more and more, these devices don't have to do much computation. The computation is going wirelessly back up into that hosted cloud. And there's not just one cloud. There may be hundreds of clouds, thousands of clouds, eventually millions of clouds. Some are very big, like Amazon or Apple or Facebook or Google's clouds. And others are uh, even private clouds. So it's an architecture that we'll see in information technology going on for decades. But this time, the highest person in the pecking order is not the computer scientist, it's the data scientist. So what is a data scientist? A data scientist is someone who is a mathematical quant, who has the ability to uh, think about ways in which you can extract data and use it in uh, important ways. And they're focused on uh, information that can come from lots of different devices. There are 7 million people on the planet. There are 6.5 million uh, cell phones. And yet, the projections are that by 2020, there'll be 20 billion connected wireless devices. 7 billion people, 20 billion wireless connected devices. How is that possible? Well, the way it works is that the majority of those devices are going to be M to M, machine to machine. Machines are talking to machines without the intervention of human beings. Now, the thing that is really important is to think about what's inside of the little uh, smartphones that we have today. If you take this iPhone 5, uh, it has a lot of sensors in it. <laughs> it, it, it has a touch screen. That's a sensor. It has a microphone in it. That's a sensor. It has a camera in it. That's a sensor. It has an accelerometer in it, which you know, helps it for uh, staying stabilized, which way you want to view it, or for games. So these are all sensors, but they're built into the mobile device. In the future, we're going to start to see these sensors being independent of the mobile devices. And in fact, there'll be miniaturized wireless sensors that can do all kinds of amazing things. And they are going to be working with unstructured data, much more complex. This means all different data types of video and music and text and audio, uh, not structured in any particular way as we've lived in the past with structured data. And it means that we have to have entirely new kinds of architectures to deal with this. Now let's go over to healthcare. In healthcare, we're now starting to see products coming out that can have wireless sensors that can transmit uh, information from the body up into a smartphone and then up into the cloud. So for example, you may have seen uh, devices that have accelerometers in it that are like watches that fit on your wrist. Uh, there are uh, devices that are getting miniaturized which can measure your change of weight every day. There are devices that can measure your heart and monitor it. There are devices that can measure your fluid retention. Now those are just the devices that are using sensors that may clip onto your belt or onto your bra uh, or be inside of your shoe. There's a whole other era of sensors that are being developed which are ones that can slightly scratch the surface of the skin. Uh, you wouldn't even uh, feel it if it happened. And what they are doing is that they are going in and they are taking s samples of bodily fluids inside of your system. So for example, if you take blood, uh, the reason why blood is uh, so ideal to be able to uh, get information about uh, different uh, proteins and uh, uh, different attributes inside of your uh, system is that it has oxygen in it. But if you oct use oxygenated uh, skin, uh, which you can do with some of the new sensors, you're able to capture almost all of the same information, and you can do it in real time, not having to go in for a blood test you know, several times a year. You can actually be monitoring this in real time, not feel any pain on it, and in a little sensor that may have a battery life of up to a year, and then it's wirelessly sending over to a smartphone and going up to the cloud. Now, why would anybody want to do that? Well, 10% of the population in the United States is what we call chronic care patients. They represent over two-thirds of the healthcare spend in the US. Uh, they're the ones who have multiple disease state problems. They're the ones who have the hardest time losing weight, who have uh, things like type 2 diabetes and sleep apnea and uh, congestive heart failure. And so if you can use this kind of information to do with data scientists, a predictive analysis, with probability theory, 
being able to take um, um, various types of samples and, and be able to predict this person is likely to have a stroke uh, for the following reasons in the next eight days, that's an incredibly important piece of medical information. If you're able to use it as information that can be feedback to the patient to get them to change their behavior, which could mean saving their life or changing the quality of their life, that's another important way to use sensors. An example of how far this can go in sophistication is uh, work that's going on at Caltech in what's called proteomics. Proteomics is looking at proteins. We have approximately 26,000 genes inside of our body, but we have around 2 million proteins. And these proteins are as important as water and oxygen to our survival. And yet the proteins can get out of balance. So for example, one of the uh, proteins is called ferritin. Ferritin measures the amount of iron that we have in our system. If you have uh, a loss in iron, uh, that can be a, an indicator of a potential serious medical problem. So being able to monitor something like ferritin uh, with somebody who is a chronic care patient um, can be extremely important. But not just monitor one or two proteins, but imagine being able to monitor thousands, tens of thousands of different proteins. Imagine being able to monitor uh, all different types of um, you know, blood tests and equivalents, you know, just by using a, sc a scratch below the subsurface of the skin. So the ability to take all this information uh, and the massive scale at which this is uh, ha going to happen is something that we never could have even dreamed of even five or six years ago. But to give you an idea how far we've come with cloud computing, um, let me just uh, show you uh, how this is such a game change from anything we've had before. Today, one second on the internet uh, captures more content than all of the content that was on the internet in total in the world 20 years ago. So this is something that is not the traditional uh, linear graph that uh, uh, people think of in the high-tech world when they think of Moore's Law. Moore's Law has been dictating uh, with great accuracy the performance improvement of a microprocessor, and it has been the reason why personal computers you know, were eventually you know, able to go beyond the simple things they did in the 80s to the internet and more powerful computers, and now uh, we have smartphones which are many, many times more powerful than even the most powerful computers, even the supercomputers uh, of a couple of decades ago. So that was known as Moore's Law, and it is a uh, straight linear line. But what we're happen seeing happening now is what's called an exponential growth line. And I'm talking now about the technology, the technology of computers, which used to be measured by the power of a microprocessor. Now we're able to, with big data uh, analytics, we're able to go and uh, look at the data at a, at a much uh, uh, more efficient rate. And we're also able to uh, store information uh, much more efficiently. For example, two years ago, the cost of storage was about $5 a gigabyte. Today, it's 25 cents a gigabyte. So we're going through a revolution in change of what you can do with the cloud. And the revolution is just beginning with mobile wireless sensors. Um, they won't just have to be built into a device. They'll actually be miniaturized, and there'll be things which uh, people can wear. Uh, they'll have, have them on all the time. And the level of information that will come out of it uh, has a, the potential of being a game change in healthcare. My sense is that uh, this is about what it felt like when I joined the personal computer industry 30 years with microprocessors. Yet uh, we're looking at um, the sensor just beginning in terms of its sophistication. And I would imagine that over the next 10 to 20 years uh, that we're going to see the sophistication of little sensors uh, changing uh, healthcare in ways that people couldn't have imagined. Uh, this can lead to better medicine, it can lead to lower cost medicine, it can lead to healthier people. Uh, and it begins to bring together uh, the Asian version of medicine, which is thinking of the body as a system, and the Western uh, concept of medicine, which is to think about uh, medical events. These things start to come together. So, whether it will um, be 
commercially important in the next year or two. Uh, that would be highly speculative. But if you look at things over the period of, of, of a decade, uh, as Bill Gates uh, often said, uh, we overestimate the importance of things in the near term and we underestimate the importance of things long term. Uh, the th thing that always drove the most successful uh, technology geniuses that I had a chance to work with over the years uh, was this sort of gnawing feeling inside of them that there has to be a better way. And yet healthcare missed the PC revolution. It missed the internet revolution. It can't afford to miss the cloud mobility and sensor revolution. Thank you.